Sure, I'm Dan Pauly. I'm a professor at Harvard Medical School in the Department of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery, but I work at Mass Eye and Ear Infirmary in Boston, Massachusetts, uh, where I'm the director of the Lauer Tenderness Research Center and uh, the interim director of the Eaton Peabody Laboratories. Animal models for tenderness. Well, the, I think the um, I mean, the best way to think about what animals can do for tenderness research is not to model the very complex, uh, complete disorder of tinnitus, but rather to model a biomarker that is thought to be critical to the symptoms of tinnitus. So what I mean by that is um, it's no longer really in vogue to say you have a mouse model of, say, autism, but rather there's a, a feature of that's found in the brains of an autistic person, like an excitability feature or a certain circuit in the brain that is uh, abnormal. And it's that, that abnormality that you can model in a mouse. The, the more complex behavior and the sort of spectrum of, of mood and stress and perception that are, that are part of tinnitus is, I think, implausibly modeled in a mouse. Even the whether mice hear a phantom sound is, um, I think, very much open to debate. And the behavioral proof of tinnitus in a rodent is usually uh, uh, unconvincing to many people. But what, what the animal models are great at um, is latching on to a biomarker that's seen in humans and showing that you can produce it in an animal and then being able to drill down to the cell types and the features that would be therapeutic targets. So the animals have a critical role to play um, in the search for a, uh, effective treatment for tinnitus, but um, more as um, modeling a, a biomarker and identifying uh, therapeutic targets. Right. Well, there's an ocean of possibilities and opinions, that's for sure. But if you look at where the points of consensus are in the field, um, there's a lot of folks who buy into the idea that there's a, a loss of input from the ear as a triggering feature in tinnitus that um, doesn't always show up in an audiogram, but is sort of occult or hidden. Um, and it can be seen with some types of measurements or inferred through some types of measurements, but that the uh, loss of afferent channels that convey acoustic signals from the ear to the brain um, sets up problems in the brain, and that um, if you were able to regenerate those afferent transmission channels through synapse repair, you could um, turn down or eliminate the phantom percept. And certainly the Evidence from cochlear implant recipients who have tinnitus, you know, is good, strong evidence for boosting the peripheral signal is one way to turn down the amplifier in the brain and get rid of tinnitus. So that's, that's, obvi that's an important uh, area of work for, for therapies. Second, um, there's you know, broad consensus that, that some important aspect of the tinnitus pathology is related to hyperexcitability or hypersynchrony, which are themselves sort of byproducts of reduced inhibition. So finding ways to reinvigorate inhibition would be a, like a, a really important um, target. Uh, or the flip side is ways to reduce uh, hyperactivity. So like the work on um, potassium channel modulators and intrinsic excitability or re reinvigorating inhibition, all, all those seem like, like worthy targets. But for the, for the third area, I think we, it's important to just remember that um, the burden of tinnitus um, um, is not highly correlated to the, whether you hear the phantom sound or not. I mean, there's a lot of people that have a tinnitus percept. I have tinnitus, and I'm among the fortunate who have it, but it doesn't really bother me. And there's others for whom it's uh, debilitating. And all these things that we're talking about that researchers are keen on studying don't really relate to the, how um, disruptive tinnitus is in life. It's all very upstream, very early, that it's a purely auditory disorder. But tinnitus disorder, the people who, who experience um, 
mood dysregulation and anxiety and, and so forth. It's, it's, there's some other important target. And I think the problem is that um, the things that we measure in animals and humans are less related to burden, even though burden is the sort of outcome that the clinicians and the patients care most about. So I think that's a really important um, area for research. So the scientists like to split, and some like to lump, but coming up with categories is important if the categories are based on you know, true underlying biology. If, if, um, if we're going to say that um, um, tinnitus, that's uh, um, pulsatile tinnitus, is, should be treated totally differently than, say, a tonal subjective tinnitus, um, that, that type of split should be based on like, some kind of a biological basis that they, that, they are, that they differ fundamentally and not just in sort of a phenomenological way. So I don't know that tinnitus disorder and, and tinnitus are necessarily biologically different, but the, I think it's the urgency of thinking about therapies for the people who most need them. Um, that's clearly important. And th what what distinguishes the people that, for whom it's a, a disorder is that it's, it's, it's disruptive and debilitating, and the, the things that make it disruptive and debilitating aren't necessarily the auditory nerve loss or the uh, hyperexcitability in early stages of the auditory system. That doesn't get you to the mood dysregulation. Um, for that, you need to think about other brain systems. And um, I, Sorry if I'm you know, rambling a bit, but it's, this is kind of the, why tinnitus has been um, plagued in a way, is that it sort of falls in between the cracks of psychiatry, neurology, otolaryngology, and audiology. It's sort of a little bit of all, but not really claimed by any. So um, this part where the, the burden of tinnitus that implicates brain systems that aren't usually or effectively studied by auditory neuroscientists. So you need teams that can sort of traverse the brain and understand these different regions. Well, I think that's, you know, probably the most commonly performed type of study. They recruit relatively small samples and discretize them into tinnitus yes or no. Um, and then any differences that you find could be speculated to be reflective of the tinnitus. And so that problems with that kind of work and the reason that there's kind of a, a ceiling on how far that kind of work could go is that um, what do those differences reflect? Is it the tinnitus? Is it the hearing loss? Is it the uh, anxiety that comes with tinnitus or the depression? How do you sort of regress out all the things that go along with tinnitus to drill down to the essential quality of tinnitus itself and not the sequelae of tinnitus? So there's, there's no way to do that with all of them. Yes, you can do a, a design where people have matching audiograms, but that, as we know, doesn't mean that their auditory nerve integrity is matching, and it doesn't mean that they're going to be perfectly balanced for all the other sequelae of tinnitus, the, the, the mood dysregulation and other um, psychiatric qualities. So um, you really never know definitively if what the difference you see in a metabolite or in an in a MRI voxel is truly about the tinnitus. And you know, the other difficulty is those are very often very open-ended, where anything you discover is potentially meaningful. But um, the problem with that kind of work generally is that it's hard to replicate, because you pull out the biggest difference you have in your data set. But that means if you collected another data set, would the same thing come out to be the biggest difference? I mean, it's just generally, there's always noise in any sample. So whatever's the biggest is, um, you know, things regress to the mean. So if if you have hypotheses that you're testing, um, then you can be wrong. But if you're just describing a difference, then you can never be wrong. And that's why those publishing those papers is kind of habit forming because you always find something. There's always something publishable. But but you know, to move ahead, we have to say what are the dominant hypotheses hypotheses about the generators of tinnitus and the qualities that make tinnitus so burdensome for some, and then to test the hypotheses with experiments where you can disprove the hypothesis, right? Um, so, so that's that's how science advances, right? That's you take a condition that is well understood and for which there are good treatments, um, say, 
say epilepsy, okay? So epilepsy, there's a biomarker, there's, there's seizure. You can measure it with uh, EEG electrodes. Um, you can measure seizure in a mouse too. And that means that you can in the animal or any animal really, you can go down into the cellular level, the molecular level and identify the causes of these seizures. Like you may not be modeling epilepsy in the mouse perfectly, but you are modeling seizure. And then you can identify the types of channels and receptors that cause the seizure. And you can take those candidate therapies and you can scale them back up to humans and you can do proper clinical trials. Um, so that's, there are success stories in neurology. And if tinnitus is going to join their ranks, we have to find the meaningful biomarkers in human subjects that relate not just to do you hear a phantom sound, but is it bothersome to you? ask can those biomarkers be reproduced in animals and develop therapies that will mitigate those biomarkers and then scale them back up to humans. Uh, the companies that grind out clinical trials for hundreds of millions of dollars are incentivized to do that when there are objective measures of the condition they're trying to treat. So if it's a, if it's a congenital hearing loss, they can use an ABR to say, is the, does the brainstem respond to sound after this treatment without administering a survey to say, how is, your, how is your sound experience today? So I think that's maybe one of the reasons why the large biotech and companies, uh, pharma companies, are, haven't leaned into tinnitus more heavily is that um, the outcome measures are still survey-based and exposed to placebo effects. And, and we really need these objective markers to encourage the, the big players that have the money to spend and the resources to to leverage, to make the kind of progress that we, you know, we really need to make. Well, I mean, we all, researchers have a certain set of training and that defines like the type of things that they're interested in. And my, there's lots of interesting, important things to do with tinnitus. I think that, take the work of somebody like Thanos Sinopoulos, who's a synaptic physiologist, of course, he's going to be looking at um, um, channels and receptors. So th that work is important. Um, um, work like um, Stefan Maison on uh, biomarkers of auditory neuropathy are really important. But my, my training is in brain plasticity. And my particular point of view is that, um, that tinnitus reflects a particular type of hyperactivity and auditory centers of the brain that imitate the patterns of activity of when there is sound present and that in the goal to get rid of tinnitus isn't to necessarily bring all activity back to normal but it's just to break up the patterns of activity so they no longer resemble the activity that occurs when you hear sound and you can elevate activity but not have it sound like anything so we just need to sort of disrupt those patterns. So if I, if I had uh, infinite resources, that would be my focus. What, what can we do to uh, bring inhibition back just enough to disrupt these hypersynchronized events to um, uh, eliminate the phantom? Um, so I, I think bimodal stimulation is um, a promising start. There's, I've seen three studies that are, have reasonable controls that show some degree of improvement that, you know, essentially amount to sort of turning your bothersome meter down a notch, um, which is not the therapy that people want, but it's not a bad place to start. You know, it's a, it's a foothold on the, on the rock face uh, that you can, you, can, you can reach for something higher from there. So I, I would, I'm planning to focus on um, ways to sort of amplify those kinds of effects um, um, by embedding them in conditions where the brain becomes more plastic, basically. I think the, the um, way to go from there is that the, to create plasticity in adult brains, you need to push adult brains into modes where they are, where they are plastic so they can reorganize and, and retain that reorganization. And sort of passively stimulating the human nervous system doesn't usually put the brain into the levels of reorganization that you would, you would need for a long-term benefit. So I feel like there's a good, some good hints out there about, and, and to build off of those. The conference, I was, I'm, I was fairly intrigued, you know, that 
no surprise, neuroscientists are into neurons. Um, um, and I've, my point of view on tinnitus is always very neuron-centric, that it's an imbalance of inhibitory neurons and excitatory neurons and the neurons that make up the auditory nerve. But there's a lot of work on non-neuronal cell types, um, changes in glia, uh, immune markers, um, microglial responses that accompany noise-induced hearing loss. So these um, inflammation is is a in every tissue. You know, inflammation is sort of triggers uh, deleterious effects in in the host tissues and the cells. And it's fascinating to see um, all these markers of immune responses that accompany hearing loss and trying to understand the connection between neurons and the signaling they do, hair cells, and but also these cell types that aren't really part of the nervous system necessarily, they're part of an immune system, but understanding that dialogue seems important. Mm -hmm.